He joined me back in my garage and at the start of a journey to build a new battery storage solution. If like me, you've been interested in this stuff for a few years, you've probably started collecting a bunch of 18650 cells with the intention of putting them together to form packs, a bit like this one. I started down this road, got bored, gave up and sold my, most of my cells. There's just too, too much time taken to capacity check, weld the cells together, and I also have my doubts about the long-term reliability as well. So this new battery I'm looking to build won't be using those. But before I get into the details, this series of videos is going through all the steps you need to, to consider before embarking on a battery install. In this video, I'm going to cover the design and sizing of the battery, along with some of the legal paperwork required. First off, the wall you see behind me is where I'd, I'd actually like the battery to go. It's in the garage, which is uh, directly attached to the house. Ideally, I'd uh, wall mount the uh, battery high up out of the way, as I still like to be able to access these work surfaces underneath. I should also have room for the inverter next to it, although some of this stuff is going to need moving around. So before you even start thinking about having solar panels or a battery storage system fitted, first take a look at your energy usage. If you have an electric smart meter installed in your uh, property, you can almost certainly get access to the data from your energy supplier. In the UK, I use Octopus Energy and they have a useful area on their website to download the data. I use an electric vehicle tariff called Octopus Go, which gives me four hours of low cost electricity every night, which is normally used to charge the car. I'll leave my Octopus referral link in the description if you want to help support this channel. I've used Google Sheets to process the smart meter data, and here's a graph of the results. The green bars are electric usage when the energy is the lowest cost in those uh, four hours each night. Looking at my winter usage, which is when solar production is the lowest, my average daily usage is 18.7 kilowatt hours. This includes charging my electric car. So this gives me some indication as to the size of the battery I would need. I also know that the two biggest energy consumers in my house are an electric oven and the kettle. Both of these are 3000 watts each, but the kettle is only on for a few minutes. And although the oven will use a lot of energy whilst it uh, heats up, it's relatively low and energy efficient once it's up to temperature. It's probably worth me covering the two main types of battery storage setups found in people's homes. Here's a diagram of a hybrid inverter setup. The energy from the solar panels flows into the inverter, which then charges batteries and also provides AC power into your house and also potentially exporting to the grid. When it's dark and the solar isn't producing power, the battery can provide energy from the, from the inverter to generate electricity. The benefit of this setup is that there are relatively few parts and the energy losses should be less when charging the battery. The battery voltage can also be a, a bit higher, which again helps to reduce energy loss. One of the downsides of this is a, a single point of failure. If the inverter stops, both solar and battery storage are useless. On the other hand, in an AC coupled system, two inverters are used, one for the solar and one for the battery. The downside is the energy losses in converting the solar DC power into AC and then back to DC to charge the battery. A positive, however, is the ability to have multiple solar systems feeding a single battery. You could also have uh, other forms of energy generation, like a wind turbine. If you've seen my previous video on my uh, solar installation, then you'll be aware that I'm uh, in the United Kingdom and I also qualify for, for the historic solar feeding tariff which I've had for about 11 years. What that means is that I cannot alter or tamper with that solar PV installation, or I risk losing the benefit of that scheme. So that rules out any battery storage which needs to replace my existing solar inverter. And therefore I'm looking into an AC coupled system connected to the grid. Now we know that I'm after an AC coupled solution. Let's take a look at what products are on the market. The GrowWatt has a good reputation and people have fitted uh, non-grow watt branded uh, batteries. So it seems like a, a good candidate. The Huawei only appears to work with their battery packs. And I didn't like the fact that it requires an extra energy meter installed on the incoming grid connection. So I've ruled that one out. Give Energy is a popular brand in the UK. However, this one is ruled out because you need to be a registered installer to get access to the configuration of this inverter, which is a big no from me. So finally, it brings us to the SOFAR ME 3000 SP. This is a 3000 watt inverter charger, which supports LIFE PO4 batteries and uh, doesn't require a registered installer 
or even an internet connection to work. If you didn't know, the UK and most of Europe is in a bit of an energy crisis. UK electricity prices have quadrupled in less than a year. So everyone who, who, uh, who can is trying to install solar and battery storage. This makes buying any type of ready-made battery almost impossible. And resellers of the inverters will typically only sell them if you're also buying batteries at the same time. I managed to find a used ME, ME3000 unit on eBay, which was guaranteed as working and fully tested. So time to do a bit of DIY and start clearing, clearing up the garage. I'm sure I was meant to be tidying up this space. <laughs> Never mind. So before we get carried away with DIY, to install any grid connected solar or battery storage or car charger, car charger in the UK requires approval and permission from the local distribution network operator, otherwise known as the DNA. These are the companies who run the uh, national grid. There are 14 different district networks or DNO regions here in the UK, owned by about six different companies. My supplier is Western Power Distribution. To connect equipment to the grid, it must be of a suitable quality and comply with the relevant uh, standards. There are also limits as to how much energy you can import and export to the grid to ensure that the uh, grid remains balanced and safe to use. There are two standards known as G98 and G99. G98 covers solar installations which could export up to 3.68 kilowatts to the grid, which is 16 amps at 230 volts. Anything over that requires the G99 standard. G99 is also used where battery and solar combine to potentially generate and export more than that 3.68 kilowatts. To comply with either of those standards, the equipment you, you're installing also needs to comply with the electrical safety standards. Once certified, the device is known as type tested. Here you can see that the uh, report for the ME3000 SP inverter, which, which is fully approved. Unfortunately, a full G99 application can take many weeks to be approved. But luckily, there is also a shorter fast track application process. This is applicable to single phase installations that have solar rated up to a 16 amp and also battery storage also rated up to 16 amp. To comply, you also need another standard called G100. G100 is a, a standard to limit the export from a battery storage device. This means that the battery won't export to the grid at over 16 amps. Again, so far has provided the G100 compliance documentation. 
So I'm able to use the, the fast track process with this particular inverter. The fast track process on the Western Power website walks you through a few questions to see if you're eligible. You also need to supply a diagram with the application, highlighting what is being changed and how it will connect to the grid. This is the diagram I submitted with my application. A fast track application should normally take a week or two to, to get approved. I email my application over to Western Power on the 31st of August at 12.22 p.m. To my surprise, I got an email back just 40 minutes later approving the connection. So very well done, Western Power. Nice to see large corporate companies being so responsive. This acknowledgement letter means that the installation can continue. However, that's not the end of the regulations. The electrical installation must comply with the current standards and a commissioning certificate provided by them to the DNO. So that rules out a completely DIY installation if you want to stay legal. You must either use a registered electrician who has the required permissions or use the local council building control to inspect and issue a certificate. But that's a very expensive route to take for electrical installations. Thank you for watching part one of my battery video. Uh, this will be a sort of ongoing series of probably three or four videos. Um, there'll be some more electrical insulation work coming soon, as well as the uh, battery um, build. And I've also got quite an, quite an interesting design for uh, some sort of battery storage case as well. So we'll, we'll wait, wait and see for that. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Um, like, like and thumbs up this video as, as, uh, as you're always asked to do on YouTube. But it really does help these, these small channels uh, make some progress. So thanks, thanks again for watching. I'll see you on the next one.